So I'm really excited to introduce Chiku Reddy. Um, just, let me get the official bio out of the way. Chiku Reddy's first collection, Facts for Visitors, was published by the University of California Press in 2004. And his second book, Voyager, was published by the same press in 2011. He also has a very exciting book link for Conversities, written in collaboration with Dan Peachy Quick. And he has a critical study called Changing Subjects, Digressions in Modern Art Poetry. He's an assistant professor at the University of Chicago. Um, so, Facts for Visitors is, um, his first collection is one of my favorite debut collections, a collection that I return to constantly. And each time I do, I gain new revelations, which is remarkable considering how many times I've read it. Um, Reddy's carefully considered lyric, while delicate and limpid, always troubles, always interrogates. He has, and, and he has continued to astonish in his visionary second collection of erasures called Voyager. Um, so let me just kind of briefly illuminate two of Reddy's obsessions, or maybe two obsessions, I think. One is, Reddy is one corrupt man. Um, he's a, he has an obsession with corruptions. In his first collection, um, he has a prose poem titled Corruption, which meditates on the ink made from cuttlefish. It says, once dead, its body begins to glow. This mild phosphorescence reaches its greatest intensity a few days after death, then ebbs away as the body decays. You can read by this light. <clears throat> he focuses on the source of ink, the cuttlefish, uh, uh, as the cuttlefish putrefies, and out of this corrupted body comes illumination. Out of Reddy's own corruptions of source material, there is also illumination. He revisits, borrows, and remakes classic, classical canons from Dante, canonical works from Dante, Kipling, and Stevens through his excellent narrative turns in the Tertiarima of Villanelle. His inv inventions and interventions are perhaps most explicit in Voyager, where Reddy erases the former UN Secretary of General Kurt Waldheim's memoir, The Eye of the Storm. Um, the UN's, the former UN Secretary of General, which was, uh, and the memoir was already a corrupted text for Valdheim's omissions of his past as a Nazi intelligence officer. In the brilliant Voyager, Reddy effaces Valdheim. Is that how you pronounce his name? Yes. Okay. He abuses and meddles his statements so that history is restructured, but it's not just a dispassionate exercise. In his strikes bruise, there is an enduring song of despair, compassion, complic complicity, and recrimination. His others, um, I mean, he has many obsessions, but let me list one more, which is the world. Uh, the world is encanted throughout his first and second books. Uh, his poems track the faced boundaries of a globalized era. In his visionary quote, uh, book, I mean poem, Fundamentals of Esperanto, the speaker sells his Whitman's Leaves of Graphs uh, for a kitschy how-to book on Esperanto. What are we to make of this transaction, the exchange of Whitman's book of phrase that embraces multitudes to a manual on Esperanto, a failed utopic vision of a totalizing global common language? Also striking is his choice to focus on a UN general, the spokesman for world humanity. In Voyager, he gives the Steinian, uh, he, he, gives, uh, he repeats the Steinian chant, Quote, the world is the world is the world. With each repetition, the world diminishes to word. With each repetition, it becomes abstracted. But like Inger Christensen, who writes, quote, apricot trees exist, apricot trees exist, ready wills the world into existence through the song of repetition. There are harlot hallucinations of worlds and other worlds in his poems, the invented timeless old world elsewheres and facts for visitors to the totalizing world agenda of Waldheim's memoir that ready ransacks to find the fractured, hidden human humanity within. Please welcome Chiku Reddy. I'm going to read um, from something new, just the beginning of something new. Um, it's a poem about 
uh, teaching. It's called Readings in World Literature. It's the name of the class. There's a uh, epigraph uh, to the poem from Berlioz's letters. Time is a great teacher, they say. The pity of it is, she kills all her pupils. One, <clears throat> and I'll, I'll be skipping around uh, here, but I'll be skipping sections so the numbers won't necessarily make sense. One, in the dismal, inky, and unprofitable research of a recent leave of absence, I came across an inscription on a historical prism of Ashurbanipal, which I found to be somewhat disquieting. Of an enemy whose remains he had abused in a manner that does not bear repeating here, this most violent and scholarly of Mesopotamian kings pronounces, I made him more dead than he was before. Prisms of this sort were often buried in the foundations of government buildings, and therefore intended to be read by gods, but not men. Somewhere in the maze of carols and stacks, I thought I could hear a low dial tone, humming without end. In Ashurbanipal's library, there's a poem written on clay, which corrects various commonly held errors regarding the world of the dead. Contrary to the accounts of Mulian, Odysseus, and Quasi Benefo, for example, it is not customarily permitted to visit the underworld. No, the underworld visits you. Two. Tunneling through sleep, the underworld visits a secondary character. Closing the door to the dream behind him, he notices that the inside bolt is thick with dust. The inmates, their mouths stained with clay, are suited in feathers. At the end of the corridor, he arrives at a registration desk. There was the queen of the underworld, the goddess Ereshkigal, before her crouched Belen Seri, the clerk of the underworld, holding a tablet, reading aloud in her presence. She raised her head. She saw me. Who was it fetched this man here? Who was it brought this fellow here? Cuneiform tablets describing the Mesopotamian house of dust frequently refer to a clerk who must enter the name of those scheduled to die each day. Little is known of this indefatigable figure. First, she has only one inexhaustible theme. Second, she writes for an ideal reader, the Lady of the Dead, who perpetually tears her hair with fingers like pickaxes. Third, she writes in a timeless form, which allows for considerable prosodic variation en route to a fixed conclusion. Three. Some fragments from Ashurbanipal's library may have fallen from an upper story as the royal palace burned, while others were fractured by weather, the plow, war, or archaeology itself. In the twilight of the last millennium, however, one buoyant Assyriologist predicted that the holes in this poem will undoubtedly be filled by further discoveries of tablets in the ruined mounds of Mesopotamia. But there's so many holes. The hole in which the, heater, in which the hero and his friend pray for safe passage to the cedar forest. The hole containing an account of the friend's pitiable death throes. The hole punched through the bottom of the burnt out Humvee. The hole where the grave used to be. I'm afraid recent developments in this region make Professor George's prognostication less than likely. For the time being, this house of dust, older than Hades, is in pieces all over creation. Four. Already it is beginning to seem that I cannot avoid the subject of this nation's interminable occupation of the Republic of Iraq. But I would have preferred to write something along the lines of a poetic essay on comparative underworlds. For the past few years, I've taught an introductory course titled Readings in World Literature, which has generally proven to be a disappointment both to myself and to the students 
some in head scarves, some occasionally dressed in fatigues, who have registered for this seminar in order to satisfy their humanity's requirement. It confirmed my hatred of epics and reaffirmed my faith that I will never study medieval literature. The instructor is fairly intelligent and enthusiastic about his brand of writing, but is unreceptive, even intolerant, of anything that is not a poem, or a poem in prose form. Made me question the value of higher learning. It can so easily become detached from real life. I thought that by writing about teaching, I might learn something. There would be assignments, a midterm, and a final examination, followed by some sort of internal unraveling and the sound of snow falling on rooftops at night. I needed to find my footing in the order of things. And because I know almost nothing about the world, I decided to work my way up from below. Five. Introduction to the Underworld, cross-listed with Compilet. In this course, students will be ferried across the river of sorrow, subsist on a diet of clay, weigh their hearts up against a feather on the infernal balance, and ascend a viewing pagoda in order to gaze upon their homelands until emptied of all emotion. Texts will include the Egyptian Book of the Dead, the Tibetan Book of the Dead, the Mayan Book of the Dead, the Ethiopian Book of the Dead, and Muriel Rukeyser's Book of the Dead. <laughs> the goals of the course are to acquaint students with the posthumous regimes which entrench the division of humankind in perpetuity, and to help them develop the communication skills that are crucial for success in today's global marketplace. <laughs> All readings in English. Requirements include the death of the student, an oral presentation, and a 20-page final page. Seven. I promised my wife that I would call Dr. Song today. After putting the baby down for her nap and slipping outside for a smoke, I lifted the receiver. The sound it emitted, which I've heard without pause countless times before, seemed to me otherworldly now, like somebody's finger playing upon the wet rim of a crystal bowl in a derelict theater before the wars. I can't say how long I stood there listening. It may have been seconds or seasons. The rings of Saturn kept turning in their groove. For reasons I do not fully understand, my unit on Dante was not scheduled until the following quarter. I dialed 1-800-INFERNO, and before the first ring, a woman's voice answered in heavily accented English. Is it you? I think so, I replied. Outside my window, the honey locusts sprinkled their pale spinning leaves. Focusing on one as it fell seemed to slow the general descent. O oh, creature, gracious and good, traversing the dusky element to visit us who stained the world with blood, the woman recited, as if reading against her will from a prepared text. I could hear rain trickling in a gutter spot on the other end of the line. Please remove my name from your list, I said, and place the receiver back in its cradle. Eight. While outlining the requirements of our first critical essay of the term, I notice a hand rising tentatively, like a snake charmer's serpent in the classroom's farthest corner. What if I'm ideologically opposed to revision, asks the red-headed boy in a new slave's t-shirt. A city bus unloads its pageantry just outside the window. A handful of sparrows erupts from the equestrian statue on the quad. I remember Sun Tzu's advice to humanities instructors, which I review on index cards on the eve of each new term. Hold out baits to entice the enemy feign disorder, and crush him. What exactly is your ideology, I ask, mentally stroking my beard. <laughs> I'm a Zen-Nax-like crypto-objectivist, replied my interlocutor. 
How about you? Removing the stray bran flake that I've discovered too late, lodged in my beard, I have no choice but to improvise. Pro-recycling? Anti-genocide? A voice from beyond my peripheral vision says, you're nothing but a pseudo-Kantian neoliberal mirage with meta-narcissistic tendencies. No, I'm not. Yes, you are. No, I'm not. Yes, you are. Nine. A window onto the purgatorial cosmology of late imperial China may be found on page 26 of Leon Uyghur's Folklore Chinois Modern, Sien Sien, Imprimerie de la Mission Catholique, 1909. Throughout his 40 years of residence in the Celestial Empire, this unsung Jesuit sinologist labored to dismantle what he once called the whole unbearable grid into which we have forcibly cantonized God's children. Contemporary Anglophone readers, however, must do without an English version of Father Weaker's folklore. I don't want any more English translations, he writes in a letter to his superiors, dated 3 February 1929. English benefits Protestants, and it is not my goal to do so. Thus, the strange tale of Chen from Hu Chu Fu remains largely unknown in this land. But if you'll pardon my French, which is damnable indeed, I thought I might venture the following rough English rendition for purposes of instruction. Draft only. Please do not circulate. 10. In Hu Chu Fu, the magistrate's assistant Chen was taking a nap in his study. Suddenly, a spirit appeared and beckoned to him. It led him down a path hidden by rustling thickets of bamboo to a clearing where, on a pedestal, an enormous mirror waited in the moonlight. Regard what you once were, intoned the spirit. Looking into the mirror, Chen saw a man in a quaint cap and scarlet shoes, dressed like a scholar from the past. Now see, said the spirit, what you were in the life before that one. Chen looked again into the mirror and saw a high official in an old Ming costume, black cap, red robe, belt with jade buckle, black boots. Just then a servant entered the clearing prostrated himself before Chen, and said to him, Don't you recognize me? I was your servant in Tatung Fu. But then again, that was over 200 years ago. With that said, he handed a scroll to Chen. Que si? Chen asked. Voi si? said the servant. Uh, I'll skip a few sections. Chen has to go to the underworld, and he's put on trial. Uh, for war crimes uh, that he committed in a previous life. It could happen to anyone. 13. Our nanny called in sick yesterday, and I stayed home with the baby, watching a tree squirrel tuck twigs and trash into a wreck of a nest outside the kitchen window instead of continuing with my translation. I love eyebrows, announced Mira, crumpling her bib. I love napkins. I love upstairs. On the radio, a program about efforts to restore various archaeological sites in and around the provincial capital of Al Hila, where the ancient Mesopotamian city of Babylon once stood. Speaking through an interpreter, a government official described how the 2,600 year old paving stones of the ancient city's processional way had been crushed under the treads of M1 Abrams tanks. Concertino wire lined extensive trenches dug for firing positions. A heliport had been constructed in the ruins. The remains of a ziggurat, which some scholars believe may be the original site of the Tower of Babel, however, appeared to be spared for the time being. I love flowers. I love fire, Mira continued. I love foreheads, too. 
At some point in the day, Dr. Song left a message for me, but I couldn't make anything of it. Later that evening, I looked in the bathroom mirror to see if I could discern any trace of infractions from a previous life. All I could see, though, was the chipped and tarnished surface of the mirror itself, flickering almost imperceptibly. I looked again. This time, to my relief, I saw a man dressed like a scholar from the recent past. Vintage cardigan, thinning hair, an untenured affect of worry beyond repair. I love forks. I love giraffes. I love handles, too. Fourteen. Melanoma, from the ancient Greek, Greek verb melino, to blacken, combined with the nominalizing suffix ma, which indicates process or action. Hence, pragma, action or occurrence, from prato, to do, or poema, poem, from poieo, to make. These days, it is obligatory for survivors' narratives to muse upon the etymologies of their various illnesses and medical treatments. It lends grandeur to the experience of weaving through red book in an empty examination room while dressed in a paper gown that won't draw clothes around the back. But I cannot refrain from wondering at how a description, black, becomes an action to blacken, which in turn becomes a thing, melanoma, a darkening. There's a whole grammar and metaphysics to this black traffic. The root points backwards to the Sanskrit mala, dirt, or filth, and forward to our modern English melancholy. Uh, I'll skip a few, I'll just read one or two more sections. Uh, what I'm skipping here is the end of Chen's story in the underworld. Or, uh, he, he arrives before the judge and uh, is essentially uh, acquitted for, for silly reasons. 17. <clears throat> the odds are good, Dr. Song tells me in his office. Still, he blinks too much as he answers my wife's questions about this perplexing case. Melanoma is exceedingly rare among individuals of my dusky extraction and virtually non-existent among younger members of this population. You're a medical miracle, joked one nurse before I went under, but not the good kind. At least my tests show no spread to the neighboring lymph nodes, which lowers the mortality rate within three years to roughly one in 10. Not bad odds. I resolved to not make too much of my condition in the days to come but the complimentary brochure that I take from the Iraq as I exit the reception area says I mustn't make too little of it either. In this respect, my condition is not unlike the war. I don't want to make too much of it in my ambient transactional order, but I don't want to make too little of it either. 18, and this is the end of Chen's story. The judge ordered the spirit to accompany Chen home. They retraced their steps through the pathway hidden by bamboo and emerged into the clearing with the mirror once more. There, his old servant congratulated Chen on his acquittal. Come, said the spirit with a smile, and see what you were in this life. Chen looked in the mirror and saw himself dressed as an assistant magistrate of the Tsing dynasty. Now see what you're going to become. At these words, Chen was so convulsed by horror that he awoke, bathed in great beads of sweat. He was stretched out in his study, his whole family weeping around him. Somebody told him that he had lain dead to the world all day and night, the area around his heart alone maintaining some faint trace of human warmth. Suspended at intervals throughout the court of the otherworldly judge, Chen had noticed a number of banners adorned with infernal maxims. He could remember none but the following. The court of the dead makes exceptions for no one. 
when the waters fall, the stones appear. Thus everything is revealed in its time. All is counted on the infinite happiness. <coughs> Thanks. It's fitting that Sarah Riggs' new book, Autobiography of Envelopes, begins with an invocation from Yeats. For Riggs and Yeats are conjurers, both. And in this book of stanzas, what Riggs conjures is a lot. When she writes, the abolition of the quotidian is well-timed with the arrival into the quotidian. She tells us one way to read these poems as testaments to the impossible task of experiencing time while taking note of the events it envelops. For time and its illusions are a primary subject here. Largely, the hour swallows us in. And yet, a common anxiety over time's passing is supplanted by a different tone, something calm but alert, like an animal that knows what it means to wait without letting down its guard. These addresses were first written by hand on envelopes, positioned where the street address used to go. I say used to, not to emphasize the decline of personal letter writing, but to make note of how Riggs, in her series of books written in forms of communication technology, has moved freely through technological generations from digital to analog and back. She has published 60 textos, 28 instant messages, 43 post-its, and 28 telegrams. History moves as we need it to, she suggests. It is not they who write the history books. They is also you. She acknowledges also the time warp of an existence steeped in writer's past. The reasonable distance between two breaths is a century. These misses, 11 for each letter of the alphabet, are unsendable. We can't write each other letters because contacting surface is self-conscious. And yet, we are not alone in our aloneness. The referent has not gone away. We still care about people. We care, too, about voicing, how time is voiced with a t t t t or a k or a k the breath is conjured by such lines that one can't help but read aloud. Reading aloud to ourselves seems right for these poems. Who then becomes the addresser? Whom the addressee? Are we outside or inside this reign of human comfort? Or is it not that simple? Is it the in-between of outside, then simply onto other words, resembling nothing rather well? If it be nothing, it is the nothing of it all, friendship and weather, hours and friends and rain, envelopes and being enveloped by hours, time, weather, friends, rain, all of it, malgré nous, despite ourselves. And what is left, finally, of this conjuring? The remainder, the wish, the spell? The direction is to begin to read. Sarah Riggs is the author of 60 Textos, Waterwork, Chain of Minuscule Decisions in the Form of a Feeling, and Word Sightings, Poetry and Visual Media in Stevens, Bishop, and O'Hara, and translator of works by Isabel Caron, Etel Adnan, and others, a member of the bilingual poetry collective Double Change, and founder of the inter-art nonprofit Tamas. She lives in Paris, where she is a professor at NYU in France. She is at work on a series of film poems. As Riggs observes, the stanzas are rough at their edges, friendly in the main, for it's in connection that the synapses create. As one privilege to call Sarah a friend, I'm delighted that Stacy asked me to introduce her tonight, and I ask you to join me in welcoming her to the Poetry Project. This book is kind of a part, so I'm just going to read from it tonight, and I'm going to read five letters, including A and M, in honor of Anna. A. 
a bird, a spider. Some children's cries were present. I heard the hour. It was one. The president was shot years before. Someone was born just when I began to breathe. Inside the envelope are scraps. The plants and lives of other animals would come to be. They and the jungle would be one. It turns and turns. We can regard it as loss. Sometimes we can't help but feel it as loss. And other elements of a trickle or tendency, but to tell tales and in other ways hold a ring, thought, and phone in one hand, while saying, I'll be there, and eating an apricot. I heard it on the radio, this false sense of security. We all did, and in the wind. We can't write each other letters because contacting the surface is self-conscious. How random is the iris that grows where it is planted? Out of nature, out of time, out of everything. The apocalyptic thinking of the nature of the metaphor. We are in time, at present. Do we drop out when we die? The spider is neither content nor discontent in its web. The rain asunders in. Changeling featured in grass alcove hollows. The world receives its bidding. We thought we knew where we were every hour. The impression of moving forward. Yet with each step, we get closer to what's too near. When she removed the patch, his hallucinations fluttered in the opening. Brain, heart, he was dying. Shared distortion. Remain hours, minutes, seconds, until they no longer remain for that person. A rain, a twirl of hour. We are recomposed. Lightning falls in a jagged sort of way. I can't remember myself but for the brambles, the price tags, and reindeers. Mon cher, we are together. Can you remain? These resemblances of ours may not be enough. If we open the envelope, there may be nothing inside. Is it our job to fill it? With what body or idea? And will you explain the difference? The random way we receive catcalls and missives. The hour wrenches open. There were five animals who came to inhabit it. Mellifluous, guttural chatter. The training is, so to speak, good. Lastly, the hour opens out either upwards or downwards, depending on this place. A casting of the die, a trumpeting of appeals, a merited sensation. Quick, here it comes again, a band of light. Hopefully what was inside the envelopes was not also outside. A melon cannot fit in there, for instance. We open it and remove the seeds, and so the cats climb along. Difficult for a dog to know how to do this. Rightfully slow, the tremendous place beyond. Thought, I have ceased to want to go there. I would like to remember I am here. We're actually two beings doing this reading. I have little babies awake right now, I can feel. Um, okay. Here is a sheet of paper. A cat is on the inside, a cat on the out. We remain in the lines. Snow melts, leaves abroad. We live in an extremity of climates. This hour is not itself. 
Here is an item of news pressed flat under glass. What we do ripples, not just the present and future, but the past too. It is not they who write the history books. They is also you. Under the rock is a layer of insects and assorted desiccated and living matter. What do you care who sit on the rock? You are human, say, he's only human, or Stanley, be human. And even so, we are sitting on the rock. If the lines are long and uneven, so be it. We rain in the gutters. The spillage drops on the occasional head of a passerby. The tea may be nearly cold. The cat is not my own just yet. But for an hour, you, ruler of time. This line of literature might be a line at a post office, but for a difference. We have less patience here in writing. We'd send it immediately to the receiver, as if this address were already on a sheet of paper inside your ear. The remainder of the foil is yours to crumple or flatten as you will. These later hours are yours alone. Such is determinacy. We can rock in its water, be lulled by turbulence. What I say resembles it. It's all about the body. What's really there? What's dream? If it flies or disappears, or is very small, or all, or any of these. Word. Magic pebble. Record time. Heat. An eraser. These sing, we say, and later aprilberry. This too contrived. Ain't it so? Agree. And I. Eyes, she repeats. Mount is too difficult just now. An ounce of reciprocity replaces the idea for a screenplay. What we have is a recipe. Water moves across his face. We go with accident, as usual, lines. And if so, so on will be under drenched, a cluster of quail eggs, this basket, your sack, a return to daytime rhythms. Romare died, traffic heavy around Charles de Gaulle, cat claws on tweed. The hours are pierced with a fragmentary sort of penitence, there and here, to revive mightily in the off-season, off nearly spring. These are pen, mug, surface, some Stevens, some Dickinson. One bush blooms in the garden under snow. We will wear, wear the rain, too. Let the stars stay where they are. Let us stay on earth and show one wish to make amends. It is not ours, our planet. I wrote this book in France. Um, and when I wrote the letter J, it came out in French, um, which was the first time I'd ever written in French. And I realized that I could do it. Um, so now I'm rewriting this book in French. <coughs> Trying to get as close to the French idioms as possible. But also, also recognizing the impossibility of my translating it. So it's rewriting rather than translating. Um, the remainder of the fruit, the hour, shht, the hour collapsed in two, halved, hollowed, slowly filled, the remainder, the wish, the spell, a hollow balloon filled with helium, a gentle nudge in that direction, X, the direction is to begin to read. The terrible apprehension of hollow is the part that's scary. 
The hollow itself is fine. We were in the window. The wooden frame had been eaten by termites, a frugality of you. When we rein in on the hour, it twangs as on a skylight. Some like it, some don't. Sharon does. This particular alley does not. How we are. The ring glints in the sunlight. The general halo is it. The hour is neither quick nor slow. It is not what we make it. It is our, our, our. When we rain on words, there is a twang. Some like to hear it, some do not, naturally. In this letter of leaf fall, we turn to the rain for answers. What it gives is yes. And so we are, this metal of tea, the struggle of the ancestor in that cough. All is evolution. Here today, we have survived. And if religion were a drug to ease the pain, would that be so bad? We're just stumbling along here, all of us, through comers. He and she have stories we cannot reach. When in the winter you shiver, think of Stefan. When in the month you plead, think of the Virgin Mary. Yes, she too is a politician. A projection of ourselves is heroic without the messy bits. And if we write a letter that doesn't hide, where were we when it rang? The hour, he left on how wit, Tom, T, freeze, la peep, tulu, flower, 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 fever, flower, bouquet, flower, grave, flower, valentine, flower, 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 here. This is to say worthy of no name of telling. Remarkable there, a tisk for a task. This letter, 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 what a beautiful word. Let's sleep in its contours. More mellow, the buttercup shows your love of lemon. He was running with cupcakes, a dangerous activity. But we two are together. This is all we know for sure. You. It entered the field early. We were streaming through. We knew and did not know. It was not meant to be spoken, what the feelings were. She wanted the boundary. It was, is, will be a hug, an exercise in listening. Chur, they said. All ears was she. Some rain in that sun, a remainder of time, hour, loss in that laughter, a petite maison, a room of machines, an embrace witnessed and restrained, but smiles lastingly in sound. How to explain it's okay, a face very near and so distant, no eye contact in that eye contact. Someone searching for understanding nearby. The head like a Rubik's cube, disassembling. Shower in sight, distance, baby, swaying, precipitous, stairs. I'm poised on the ground, and you saw me, Ellen. Writing S, this hardest ounce. Here where we know the measurement, rock and rock. Fleetingly rain under your ears, and I can see it dripping. The animals all in the stable. It's their fire, yet I cannot reach you. How to explain I am only partly here, and yet I think you knew. Rain in that hour. It was a question of nearly holding your hand. I would not let go, but that the hand was clenched. Such machinations. Laconic, occasionally lugubrious light. We were together with you. We, you, I. Such large, such massive words. 
and could swim within you. The letter S swerves and is large. Under the second is the moment when the hour is a day. Remark, I drench the minute with a sort of liquid. We determine the insects and the animals, each thing indistinguishable. The planet is not loved as it should be. It's angry, on strike, mad. Yet it is not human. It does not stand to reason. Why is the recognition of the other, qui déclenche, a free fall of hurt, also love? Either way, I lie on the ground. My body curves to the planet. <coughs> How are we to know you, bird? The stone in the hour of flower, toe rated, a remainder in these covered leaves. Hour, such the tide, the gradual chirrup within shooting range. The other bit of alphabet to fill. They love you in the hour. Step outside and the envelope goes empty. We wished we were together. Both the address and return address are different. They simply crossed. Dear Sylvia, remotely Camellia, my intricate flowering system adrift, very little left of me in the breeze. I am poised in an hour wondering what it is to land. The poem addresses itself. We open, listen, magnifying. So the last section I'll read is the last section of the book. Um, and just a note to feel that, to say that um, reading here is kind of like coming home <laughs> to New York. Um, and that it's a real pleasure to read with Chico. Thank you for your reading. And also that we're hoping to get Stacy over in Paris to read for Double Change. She's a good friend of Etel and Nans as well. <clears throat> our, um, our readings for Double Change are online, so that you can see several years of archives of readings in French and English. It's doublechange.org. And we try to do trans <coughs> translations for the readings, but the only ones that I've ever done really for, for a reading or for when we did a double change reading here in New York at the Invisible Dog. Um, and so I hope to do some more of those in the years to come. Z. I am grateful for speckles and baby tea, that there's no right voice, only the one left. I am not why the sun has receded. To tell me this, yet you are why it feels. You are the witness of the microsecond within the hour. I have been running away from this minute all of my life. So simple, plaything. That unrecognizable voice on the phone, my sister's. She writes, you are a writer. And what makes it beckon so? The darkness, that you would speckle it with stars, your own, and believe they glitter. Why? Enter and ride along the coast of a wave, and on a wave, and on a wave. Rain in the hour, difficulty in receiving the why. Ultimately, it was a question, and you can't answer it, so it was a matter of listening. Not to the question, but the way each person was listening. Or framing the question. Or talking alongside was a question without words, is one, is, go gently hand along her hair, brush it with thoughts and gentle musings, remain there at the part, there are buds and pills in the palms, open the palms and let everything fall, fall, fall. Regarding the hour, there were things to say there in the cracks. We were in agreement at least about time, though already, if you think about it, that is a lot. Tricky and tender. A film of sorts. I don't know why. Wondering a lot. 
he wrote under the envelopes. Until then, the dress slipped into place. There wouldn't be room for the poems on the outside. They'd have to go in. She could count upon them. There's a bit of content in a November envelope in the event of a last address returned to sender. What it says, I've forgotten. But what it means is you to you here. A bird or a rain or a hand to receive words into the breast directly through the skin since they came through his body. He would smell as sweet were he not called. Any other name is you, a purr, a fizz, an eye. Thoughts of those who know black, there's S and I and R, M. There's the whole autobiography of the alphabet to the power of folds. Yes, our. I address you nearer than the syllable. Letters enter envelopes and voyage to receivers. And she opens and reads. And there was why. A fairy kingdom. A surprising soul. Come to a bizarre j'aime ça. One day to know the length of one's own legs, nose, to be surprised by a mirror. It really is me. This is where I live. The contents of a soul weigh nearly nothing. I am my own address. Thank you.